All right, hello again, everybody. Welcome back to Airbus 320 Tech Talk. What do all those buttons do? Thank you again so much for joining me. The topic of today's discussion is going to be the landing gear lever in the A320 flight deck. But as always, before we get started, if you like what you're hearing and seeing, please go ahead and hit the like button, hit subscribe, leave comments down below, all that kind of good stuff. It just helps me keep the channel moving forward here. So thank you so much if you've done so already for me. I appreciate that. So I'll go ahead and bring up the slide that we're going to talk about today. So as we started to mention here, the, the landing gear lever in the flight deck, of course, everybody that's watching this channel, you know that specifically this, this lever does that job exactly of just that, of raising and lowering the landing gear. But there's a, a little bit more in-depth stuff that I can share with you, and you know, maybe some things you might not have guessed about the system, or maybe some things you've been curious about. So we'll try to address the, the common questions that everybody seems to have, and, and I'll give you a little bit more uh, more insight on this one. And you know, one of the first things that I wanted to start off by telling you guys is just, the, the one really interesting thing about this landing gear lever switch itself is, is the fact that the, the switch is actually shaped like a little wheel. And there's a little bit of aviation history behind this about why this is exactly. And as you know, you, you know if you stuck your head inside any flight deck and you know, anywhere in the world and any you know, country's manufactured airplane, this is pretty much the, the case. I mean, this is the, um, you know, the norm, of course, this is the standard. But as I said, there's a little bit of history about why this is and how this came to be. At some point in time, I'm not sure exactly what year, you know, specifically, but, you know, here in the United States, the FAA came in at a certain point and, and said, you know, hey, we've been having a lot of these accidents where, you know, people or crews are inadvertently manipulating this gear switch at the wrong point in time. And, you know, maybe they were they were really rushed or they weren't looking at what they were doing and there was just distractions going on and they inadvertently manipulated the wrong switches at the wrong point in time, like we said. And this led to accidents and bad things happening, of course. So they, they sat down and they thought about, you know, well, what's one way that we kind of mitigate this error? And they thought, you know, hey, let's make this, this switch something that, like, when you reach over and grab onto this handle here, without even looking at it, you can just tactically tell that, you know, it's the shape of a wheel. And therefore, it should cue you that, you know, hey, you're reaching over onto the landing gear lever there. And, you know, don't manipulate this unless you're absolutely sure, you know, this is what you want to do. And, of course, at some point in time, you know, the ICAO regulatory body came in and, I'm sure there's been compliance and agreements, of course, across the board, you know, for every manufacturer in whatever country they reside in. And like, like we said, this is more or less the norm and everybody is doing this the same way. So that's just, you know, like I said, one thing that I wanted to point out to you if you've been wondering about that. And I can shed even a little bit more light on this and, and give you a little bit more history on it. One thing that I find pretty interesting is, um, you know, let's take a look at this, this photo right here. Now, this is a, a Beechcraft Bonanza um, you know, uh, a cockpit here essentially. So, you know, the Beach Bonanza, I, I believe 1947 was the first year they designed this airplane. So, you know, quite a bit, you know, older as far as, you know, designs are concerned and what have you. But there's there's something interesting that I can point out to you guys. And, it, you know, there may be some Bonanza experts that are watching this, but the, the best of my knowledge and the best of my research showed that, you know, this this was actually something that, you know, when the Bonanza first came out, it was designed with the the old you know, uh, sort of design in mind. And at some point in time, you know, somebody came back and tried to make a little bit of a retrofit as a result of those, the, the change in the, the Code of Federal Regulations here in the United States and, you know, the, the need to have this change. But as I said, I, I just wanted to point out, this is a great example of, you know, you look at all these switches in the, the cockpit here, the, the, the 35 series Bonanza in this case, and they're all more or less identical. And if we zoom in and actually take, you know, close, um, a closer look at this switch uh, specifically itself. This is the landing gear lever switch. And you can see at some point in time, they put this little rounded wheel looking thing on top of it. And then the other one that has the same, um, you know, uh, principle applied to it, let's say, is the flap lever. So the, the, you know, the, the gear always looks like a little wheel and the flap always looks like a little flap. And you can see they've done exactly that. And like I said, it's just, I feel this is a good example to, to tie that all together because, you know, here we can see an old design that at some point, you know, it had to get updated and retrofitted. And, you know, circling back to what I said a few moments ago, I mean, you could see how, you know, this type of design, if it didn't have these little, you know, uh, the, the little shapes on the, the switches themselves, and even those, you could argue that, you know, it's not the, the greatest way to alert the pilot that he's grabbing the wrong switch at the wrong point in time, let's say. Uh, at least it's it's something there to kind of key you into that. But like I said, I mean, you could just imagine if things are happening really fast and you're in a rush and you're trying to do something, you might accidentally reach down and manipulate the wrong switch and get something that you don't want out of the airplane to happen. And of course, you know, the, it's just all about trying to prevent, you know, these, these catastrophic types of situations in whatever way possible. And like we said, that that is the way that it, um, this has been addressed. So 
I hope that all makes sense for you guys. So let's let's come back and we'll take a look at the panel here once again. Now, um, the the slide that I showed you a moment ago was the um, the panel without the lights test being performed. So this one I'm I'm performing a lights test here. We'll we'll wrap up and, and finish up about talking about the only light that we see on this panel here. It's it's down here. If it you know hadn't grabbed your attention already, but as I said, a few things that I want to make mention of. Everybody wants to know the question about, you know, hey, if I'm sitting on the ground and you accidentally reach over and, you know, throw that switch in the up position, is the landing gear going to retract? <laughs> of course, this would be a, a huge, you know, a, a very bad thing that could happen in an airplane for obvious reasons. But of course, there are safeguards designed into the, the Airbus that prevents this from happening. Every airplane does this a little bit differently, but, you know, they all have a very similar system in place to keep this specific situation from manifesting. But in the Airbus, the way that it works is when you have a, a weight on wheels signal, or in other words, the main landing gear struts are compressed, it sends a signal to the airplane to send this little locking signal into the actual, you know, lever switch here itself. So it, when the plane knows it's on the ground. Um, when it knows it's on the ground, it activates this little lock in here, and you physically, you're not supposed to be able to move up and... Um, you know, even move the switch at all. So one of these things, like I, I'm not uh, anybody that wants to test the principle, of course, nobody wants to do that, but that is what the book says. That is the way it's designed. That's, the, you know, the method that uh, prevents the gear from inadvertently being raised on the ground. Um, the other big one uh, that uh, the Airbus has designed into it as a safeguard against, you know, damaging itself is uh, the scenario when you're in the air. If you remember back to, um, a couple segments ago, we, we talked about the, the placards and some airspeed limitations and different things as they applied specifically to landing gear. And this is a big one, of course. Like if you're going too fast in the airplane and you try to lower the landing gear, you can actually rip the gear out of the, the plane altogether if the, the parameters are egregious enough. So once again, they've, they've came in, they've designed into the system a safeguard against that happening. So um, the, the book... Uh, definition of the limitation is you're not supposed to lower the landing gear if you're going faster than 250 knots indicated airspeed. Um, so uh, the way the safeguard is written though is it says that if the plane sees a speed of 260 knots or greater, even if you were to reach up and move the switch into the down position, it's not supposed to activate anything, it's not supposed to do anything. So it kind of has this, this electronic programming built into the system. Uh, to prevent you once again from damaging the airplane in this regard. And why they, they designed that little 10 knot window into the scenario, I'm really not sure why that is, but that's what the book says and that's the way it's designed. And once again, not something that, <laughs> that I'm interested in, in testing out myself in the real world. So, uh, and then the last thing that I want to make mention of, uh, to you guys is like we said here a moment ago, this little, the red light here in the down position, this is the only light that you're gonna see on this panel here. This red light is kind of like a last resort way for the airplane to say, hey, dummy, like you're not in the, you don't have your landing gear down. You're not, um, you know, configured correctly for landing. And it's just like this bright light that's supposed to get your attention and say, oh, shoot, you know, if you, if all else failed and all the other indications in the flight deck, we're trying to tell you that, you know, you weren't in a safe condition to land. This red light, like we said, is kind of a last resort to hopefully get your attention. And the way that this one is cued is, you know, when you make that the final flap, um, extension uh, to configure the airplane for landing the, the plane once again it sees you know the landing configuration is okay and remember we have that little memo up on the uh, the EWD there that affirms all these things as well but like I said this is just kind of like a last resort thing that's tied into the system there so that's pretty much all I had to tell you guys about the landing gear lever if you have any questions about that please leave them down below I'll do my best to field them for you whatever they might be. So with that being said, I uh, had a uh, Q&A section that I'll tackle today. Um, I had a viewer a couple days ago write in with a question. Um, so first of all, um, Reicher D'Souza, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, but thank you again so much for engaging the channel and writing in, give me something more to talk about. But he had a, a, a simple question. It was more of an observation or a point of clarification, I guess you could say, but he had asked the question, if using a ground air conditioning cart, does the APU still have to be running so as to automatically supply the bleed air for air conditioning when the ground air cart is disconnected and before the engine spool up? So this is more or less, you know, what, what he's saying is essentially spot on. And it, like I said, it, it, it shows a good understanding of the system and the interconnected nature and how these things are working. But the only thing I wanted to do to talk about here is to paint a little bit more context into the real world. Because I mean, a lot of you folks are probably wondering about, you know, well, what, at what point in time do you actually make this changeover from the ground air supplying the air conditioning to the APU? And, 
You know, usually this happens on a normal day, roughly 10 minutes prior to being ready to close the boarding door. We'll, we'll go ahead and we'll fire up the APU. And uh, once that comes online, of course, we'll tell the, the ground crew to remove the air conditioning and the power once we've got everything configured on the overhead panel. So like we said, about 10 minutes prior to push is kind of that magic number when most of us are doing this. It just uh, seems to work out pretty well. And there's one small system consideration, I guess you could say too, you know, in the books, it actually makes mention of the fact that you don't want to feed the outside, um, the ground air essentially into the airplane at the same time that you're using the APU bleed to power the packs and feed, um, you know, cold air into the cabin. And, and if you, you know, one small thing to make mention of here too, is just to have this understanding of that, that cold ground air coming in from the outside is not actually routing through the packs. It's just going into this like mixing chamber unit that's the the final stopping place that all the air goes through before it routes out of the cabin so it's really just like you're, you're straight up pumping cold air just directly into the cabin without going through the packs well um, there are some valves in there that you know meter things out and you know they talk about um, if you were to you know open up the apu bleed route the air through the packs the air comes out of the packs goes into that mixing chamber and, and it kind of competes with that air that's coming in from the outside and they talk about this valve chatter and it's a, a situation we certainly try to avoid. So once again, the real world context is, you know, the way this usually goes down is, you know, we'll, we'll start the APU. Once it's all good to go, we'll tell the ground crew to remove the air. Once they've removed the air, then we'll bring the APU bleed on and we'll start to you know, bring up the air conditioning. And, you know, later on down the line, of course, we're going to use that APU bleed air to start the engine. So, um, like I said, all that I wanted to do is just paint a little bit of context to you guys about how that all looks in the real world and how it all ties together. So, that's all I've got for you guys today. Um, as always, uh, I hope you're all staying healthy and safe out there. If you want to show some support, <laughs> stop off at the uh, the Teespring store down there. Get your bus driver t-shirt. And uh, other than that, I hope you guys are having a great day. Thanks for watching. We'll talk again real soon.